afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the sixth Robert L. Harris Jr. Advancements in Science Lecture. I'm Yaela Vite, Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity and Executive Director for the CU Advanced Program, the program that has sponsored this talk. For the past six years, CU Advanced Program has sponsored the Advancements in Science Lectures, which brought nationally recognized speakers to Cornell to address campus and community audiences on gender and broader diversity issues in higher education. The CU Advanced Program was established in 2006 with a $3.3 million institutional transformation grant from the National Science Foundation. The grant's goals were to increase the recruitment, retention, and promotion into leadership positions of women in engineering and the sciences, and to institutionalize best practices to diversify our campus and improve its climate. I'd like to recognize and thank, first, the two engineering faculty who wrote this grant, Professor Sheila Hamami. Are you here, Sheila? Not yet. Uh, and Professor Marjolein van der Mulen. Could you? Uh, as well as Professor Kim Whedon, the third PI on the advanced grant. Professor uh, Whedon, here she is. Professor Robert Harris, also one of the original PI, and the person after whom this lecture is named is also in the audience, and I'd like to recognize him. Where are you, Robert Harris? Next October, the NSF funding will sunset with successful out outcomes in improving the recruitment and climate for women faculty across the university. In 2006, the PIs set a goal of hiring 75 women in the sciences and to increase the proportion of women in each department. By the end of the grant, we've hired over 80 women in the sciences. In addition, Dr. Whedon, together with Dr. Marin Clarkberg, also in the audience, I see, Director of Institutional Research, have compared the faculty work-life surveys of 2005, before the grant, and 2008, and found that in a number of climate indicators, women who were unsatisfied or less satisfied in 2005 and who took advantage of the advanced program scored higher on the climate indicators. Realizing that our work is not done, but, what we're, but that we're on the right, in the right direction, Provost Fox institutionalized the program's efforts last year and established our office, the Office of Faculty Development and Diversity, and, and more broadly, which he'll talk about in a second. I'd like to invite now Provost Ken Fox, who is also the principal investigator on the NSF-funded advanced program, to join me in welcoming you to offer a few words about his and President Scorton institutional approach to campus diversity and to introduce Dr. Steele. Thank you. Thank you, Yale, and thank you for your leadership as the executive director of the advanced program and also now as an associate vice provost. Uh, you know, I want to also just begin by welcoming everyone. We've got a great audience here for a very, very special talk. Welcome to the sixth annual Robert L. Harris Advancements in Science Lecture. As Yale said, uh, the advanced program for which she's been executive director and the faculty that led that are here in the audience. Uh, that program has now become part of something broader. It is now called, uh, part, it's part of an initiative that President Scorton announced last year called Toward New Destinations. Uh, this initiative is, is part of a very structured program in which we're holding the senior leadership of the university, the vice presidents, the vice provosts, and every one of the academic deans of colleges and schools, both accountable but also letting them be creative in the ways that they enhance diversity in the programs and the units that they hold. It's a new structure of goals and, as I said, accountability. It's also placing new es uh, emphasis on measuring results and holding those leaders accountable. And under that uh, initiative, it has the oversight of what we call the University Diversity Council, which was also reorganized a year ago. That council now has five diversity professionals, Yale being one of those with four others. It also has myself, the president, the dean and the provost of the medical college, as well as a number of vice provosts and also uh, vice presidents of the university or members of that council. Uh, and the advanced program, as I said, the initiatives launched over five years. The past five years are now a part of uh, the work that Yale leads, as well as has oversight by the University Diversity Council. Toward New Destinations actually has four areas of focus, and we've asked the senior leaders to develop initiatives that are specific and appropriate for the programs that they lead. Number one, it's in the area of composition, specifically the demographic makeup of a unit or the institution, broadly speaking. The second is engagement which reflects personal and social and professional involvement in the life and work of the university. Number three, it's inclusion, 
and that refers to the welcoming environment of our university for all parts of the community, including multicultural and interpersonal relations. And lastly, achievement. We want to have a university, a environment where everyone can succeed at the highest level, those from underrepresented groups and everyone that is a part, whether you're a student, faculty member, staff, or even our, our alumni. So today's speaker is a part of this initiative. Uh, Dr. Claude Steele is an expert on stereotype threat and its effect on groups, broadly speaking, and including achievement, engagement, and inclusion in higher education. Dr. Steele comes to us today from Stanford, where he's the James Quillen Dean of the Graduate School of Education. I know him because he was also provost at Columbia University, and we were part of what's called the Ivy Plus Provost Group. Dr. Steele is a leader in the field of social psychology, and I'm not going to uh, read to you the fellowships and other publications that he has, but I'll just uh, mention to you the national academies that he's been elected into as sort of a summary of, of his achievements. He's been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Education, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. He's a member of the board of the Social Science Research Council, and he's also on the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Board of Directors. He's uh, been at Stanford now. He's had faculty positions in a number of, of, of places, but he's also now currently, as you know, at Stanford, where he, he has held previously appointments as the Lucy Stern Professor in Social Sciences. He's also served previously as the Director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and he's also been the Director for the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. He is, uh, we use a book of his that, uh, you, that, it, that will be the focus of the talk, called Whistling Vivaldi and Other Clues to How Stereotypes Affect Us. And we're using this in different faculty groups. We're using it uh, with some of the vice presidents, with staff, and uh, different parts of the university with, with students. What I'd like you to do now is welcome Dr. Steele. Thank you. Ken, thank you for that warm uh, introduction. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here. It's an honor to give the Robert L. Har Pardon? Harris. Harris. That's what I, excuse me. <laughs> uh, the Robert L. Harris lecture. Um, it's, it's, and to also be just a part of uh, your initiative, that in, in the, your diversity initiative that you're, you're, you're starting here, uh, just hearing a little bit about it, as I just did from what Kent said, it really sounds like it's getting off to a great start, and it sounds like it has all the components of a robust initiative. So it's a pleasure to, uh, to uh, help launch that. So I'm grateful to be here for all those uh, reasons. Uh, uh, my, my mission will just be to give you kind of an overview of our research, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, you'll see some of the significance for the, the enterprises that you are about to undertake or, and have been undertaking. Uh, so think of it that way. Uh, I'll, I'll try to go for a while and then uh, and preserve some time so that you can have some questions. We can have a kind of robust give and take. That might be the, uh, the most fruitful thing to do. So that will be my uh, a strategy. I, I will cover uh, stereotype threat, social identity threat, which is a, sort of a bigger canopy concept, but very similar. Uh, and I will be making the case that these, that these phenomena, these social psychological phenomena, are important and have big effects in all of our lives, not just those of certain groups, but all of our lives, uh, in the sense that they affect big decisions that we, that we make, like where we live and who we know and what careers we choose for ourselves and, and how we perform in certain kinds of situations. Uh, all of these things uh, can be influenced in big ways in certain parts of our life by these pressures, even though they're, it's difficult to know that sometimes. So uh, I'll be making a case that these are powerful pressures, not passing pressures, but powerful pressures. Uh, still, uh, I don't want to be depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't want to leave the impression that these pressures uh, are all determinative, that uh, there are no ways around them and that people have never thought about ways of getting around them. They have. People 
doing genius things to get around them. The title of the book, Whistling Vivaldi, is one ingenious strategy uh, for getting around stereotype threat. So I'll, I'll hope to give you some good sense of that. And also uh, remedies, what we can do uh, in particular, both as institutions and as individuals to uh, get around these uh, kinds of threats. I, I almost think of it as, as toolkits, uh, toolkit for the institutions and strategies institutions can use and, and toolkits for individuals to reduce the, the unwanted effects of these threats uh, uh, in our lives. Uh, I think I can walk over here and be heard, so I, I'll do that. <laughs> um, so uh, I will... That will be my, my uh, general mission. I'd also like to give you, uh, in, in honor of the, the science uh, uh, mission of this talk, some sense of the science of doing this research. Uh, one of the big lessons for me uh, at, at, in my role as a scientist is how humbling it is. How you start out with a set of ideas, and almost every time when you put them to careful test, they're either wrong or very different than you uh, thought they were. And that's certainly the case for the work on stereotype threat and what you're ab about to hear. Uh, none of what you're about to hear were ideas that we had when we began this work. All of these ideas came from wrestling with a certain problem and then uh, trying to come up with some explanation for it, putting that explanation to test, usually finding out that it was an inadequate explanation, and then trying to come up with a better one and put that to test. And that's the sequence of science. And that's what it can do for you is to, it's the fun of it, uh, it once you get your ego under control, <laughs> uh, it's the fun of it, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's also the way ideas, I think, uh, I, I sort of trust them more when they come from this kind of process, and I want to convey that kind of, that process to you as, as I talk today. Um, I, I won't make this a big uh, scientific uh, talk. I, my aim here will be to uh, create a closer encounter with stereotype threat to give you a phenomenological experience of it to, so that it's easier to recognize the experience of it in your, in your own lives. So that will be my strategy, a close encounter. I'll begin with uh, a description of the concrete world problem that we tried to figure out uh, and that led to this work. Then I'll talk about stereotype threat a little bit to flesh out the phenomenon for you, give you some sense of how what it is and, and how it's mediated. And, and then uh, we'll get to remedies. And then at that point, I'll give a few, uh, kind of get us started, and then we can open up into a, a broad discussion of what remedies are. I'm sure you guys, what, I, what is always the case is that I, I hear remedies I've never thought of before from, the, from audience uh, uh, members. So uh, I'm looking forward to that part. OK, uh, well, wh what's the problem that got us started? It, it's a very simple one, and it, it's a kind of mystery. It's this, that for groups whose abilities are negatively stereotyped in the broader society, their abilities in some particular area are negatively stereotyped in the broader society, when they're performing really challenging work in that area, seem to underperform in relation to other groups even when, this is the mysterious part, even when they're equally prepared, have the same talents, the same preparation, the same motivation, and the like. Even when you equate for those things, uh, there still seems to be this phenomenon of underperformance, as it's called. Uh, I first uh, discovered this many years ago. I talk about this in a book uh, at the um, University of Michigan looking at grade point averages of Michigan students as a function of the SAT score they had when they came in. And what you see in general is that as, uh, as kids come in with higher SAT scores, they tend to get somewhat higher grades at Michigan. Not, not in a really, really big way, but they tend to get somewhat higher, higher grades. Uh, that's what you'd expect. But another part of the graph broke out a line just for African-American students at the University of Michigan. And the surprising thing to me, and the, 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 the evidence that started all of this uh, work, was the fact that at every level of entering SAT, if you think of that as a measure of preparation for college work, every level of preparation for college work, the African-American students were getting lower grades at Michigan than were other students. And that was mysterious to me. Why should that be the case? If the two groups, if you've got these two set of kids and they're equally prepared and equally motivated, they're admitted to 
a great university like that, why should there be uh, a difference in, in performance? What, what could be causing that? I thought if you got preparation and skills and knowledge, if you got all those things pretty much equal, then the game was over. There, was, there would be no differences. That's, that's what it's all about. I thought that would be the end of it. But the, these data were puzzling to me because they didn't show that. Uh, and then within a uh, brief time, we found that exactly the same thing occurred for women in advanced math courses at the University of Michigan. Uh, they would, if you line them up as to their SAT level, uh, especially in advanced math courses, not so much in entry-level math courses, but high-level math courses, uh, same SAT scores, same prior grades, same motivation, women were getting lower grades in those courses than men were. So again, why would that be the case since their preparation, their skills, everything was essentially the same? Uh, then we had the, the sort of uh, scientifically interesting, maybe even exciting, but uh, as, a, as a human being, kind of depressing realization that this phenomenon of underperformance happens everywhere. Certainly not just at the University of Michigan. It happens in almost any uh, integrated classroom that you can find almost at any level of schooling and at any place, Harvard Medical School, Stanford Law School, uh, the third grade in the, in the school down on the corner. Uh, it happens everywhere, this, phenom this phenomenon of underperformance. So uh, it seemed then like this is an interesting uh, and important kind of problem to understand. And uh, we took out after it. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you <laughs> the, the years sort of wandering in the wilderness uh, trying to come up with some kind of an explanation, and then we, we did some very silly things. We did some things that we just thought were going to work. Uh, and probably five or six years later, we started to get a picture that looks something like stereotype threat. So sparing you all those missteps, uh, that's what I'll, I'll say. Our argument, our explanation for this underperformance is that in big part, in big part, we think it's due to stereotype threat. Maybe not entirely. There are circumstances where I do think other things can be involved. But I think a lot of times, especially in the circumstances we're interested in, academic life, a lot of it has to do with uh, stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is a very simple uh, kind of phenomenon. Uh, as I say many, many times, it's something that happens to Everybody, there's nobody on earth that hasn't experienced stereotype threat. I think probably maybe a couple times a week, I'd say. I'd be really confident saying that. Sometimes I think it happens multiple times a day. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's this. It's simply being in a situation or doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities is relevant. Uh, when that happens, and the thing you're doing is important to you, it's, it's, it's important to your future, or you love it, or... It's important to you, you care about it. Uh, uh, then the prospect of being judged by that negative stereotype that is relevant to you just because of your identity, your identity brings online the relevance of this uh, stereotype, uh, that, that prospect uh, can be upsetting and distracting and can shadow you in that walk of life if you stay there. You have a sense that uh, of maybe discomfort, that's probably how we experience it most frequently down on the ground, is sort of a sense, sometimes vague, sometimes quite strong sense of, of discomfort. And you have a sense that it's going to be part of, of me being in this particular situation. In this particular situation, who I am uh, brings online the, the stereotype that's relevant, and, and it could at any time potentiate a judgment of me or a treatment of me. Uh, that I don't like and would make this walk of life difficult to be in. That's, what, that's the definition of stereotype threat. Uh, I think, you know, just thinking more simply, just if you can imagine in your life uh, some circumstance where uh, you really wanted to do well in something, but the people that were either watching your performance or keeping track of it somehow, you, you had a sense that they didn't believe you could do it you could be, or that you could be very good at it or that you could really stay and achieve in that domain. That's, that's what stereotype threat is. Uh, it, it's coming from this stereotype in the society about your group, and you have a sense that that stereotype about your group could lead people to have these feelings about you or expectations about you. So uh, that's kind of 
what it is. I think it's a pretty simple thing. It's probably a, a cousin of any kind of judgmental threat. You know, sometimes I give the uh, example of, uh, this was a, a, a sort of a family story of uh, Aunt Ruby, who thought that uh, our family uh, showed off their culinary skills uh, at Thanksgiving by uh, always bringing some big, too generous, and too fancy a dish for Thanksgiving dinner. That was, <laughs> that was the allegation. And you, you knew that Aunt Ruby thought that about you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, now think about what's happening on Thanksgiving morning as you're preparing this this dish, you have this, you know, Aunt Ruby's like in the room with you. You know, every, every decision you make is like negotiating how, what she's going to think and why does she think that? You're resisting it. You're, you... But there it is, you're, you're contending with it. Uh, well, stereotype threat is, is like that, except it has some really uh, uh, dastardly features to it. I don't know another word to put it, but uh, you, the, the stereotype, if the judgment is coming from a stereotype about your group, you know that not just Ruby has this view of you, but everybody in your world, in your environment has this view of you or could have this view of you because you know everybody in this environment knows the stereotype. And when you're in a situation where the stereotype is relevant, they could be seeing you in terms of the stereotype. So the, 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 when the judgment gets tied to a stereotype, it, gets a much, it becomes a much more expansive possibility. That's the, 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 the downside of, and the difference of, of stereotype threat per se. Well, um, in trying to think of examples of this, I, I gave this talk with uh, some of my former students uh, uh, last year, and they encouraged me to uh, update uh, some of my <laughs> demonstrations and, and the like. And so uh, we, were, we were sort of, you know, trying to figure out, well, let, let's, can we come up with an example of stereotype threat that's really unusual? Like, for example, where would a white male uh, feel a, a stereotype threat about an intellectual performance? Where, where, would, where would that be? Can we think of a real example? Well, we toyed with this for a while, and we came up with the idea of rapping. Rap. It's an African American form, uh, and there is in the in the uh, culture a sort of sense that well, you know, white guys just can't really do that that well. You know, the the, the stereotype is white with a mic, uh, and uh, this led us to a very interesting clip, which I'll show you now, uh, of the experience of the rapper Eminem, who is uh, you know a great. I mean, a really truly. I, I, even I, who, well, I, I won't date myself. But <laughs> I'll, I'll just say I'm, I'm impressed with some of his lyrics. Uh, you know, we had to, you'll see this clip I'm going to show you, we had to blip every other word uh, in the, in the, to get it <laughs> presentable to an audience. But, uh, but it's kind of amazing uh, use of language and so on. So at any, at any rate, what you're going to see is the, are the, the few, first few minutes of, of uh, 8 Mile, which is uh, his uh, biography. And the, he is the actor in this, uh, and this, this, is, this is a true story. Here, here's, the, here's the rapping situation and why it's so difficult and challenging. Uh, two rappers come on stage, it's called a battle. They're going to have a battle, and they flip a coin, and one rapper goes first, and that rapper, what he has to do is think up the most horrendous, horrifying insults of the other guy that you could imagine, uh, and he has to think them up on the spot, and he has to do it in time, and he has to do it in rhyme. And there's an audience there pulsing and, and evaluating this rap as it goes on. So there's a lot of pressure there. And then the poor other guy who lost the flip of the coin, he has to uh, defend himself against all the allegations made by the, the first rapper. So, <laughs> and he has to, again, make it all up on the spot, do it in time, and do it in rhyme. So that's the, the, the pressure of the situation. And what you see uh, in this uh, video is uh, uh, Eminem's backstage experience it, just before he comes on, and then you see him come on, and you see what happens. Uh, one thing I want you to just pay attention to are the things that happen to him as he tries to get on stage. The cues that he experiences, which uh, send the message of the, of the stereotype. Yeah. 
street. You know, you, you kind of get a sense of, of, of what that is. I, I wouldn't argue that the only pressure in that situation is, is stereotype threat, but it's probably a part of the pressure in that situation, maybe a significant part of the pressure. And in an interesting way, the rest of the movie, for, I'm sure many of you have seen it, is kind of a story about how he overcomes it and, and the experiences that eventually enable him to overcome it. And I think they, too, illustrate some of the things we'll talk about later as to, as to remedies and strategies for for coping with this uh, uh, kind of uh, pressure. Uh, they're not all defeating kinds of pressures, but they're formidable uh, barriers. Uh, the, I, the, the question, given the problem that we started out with, though, is do these stereotypes go to school? Does this, does this kind of stereotype threat constitute a significant pressure in, academic, in the academic performance of groups whose abilities, academic abilities, are negatively stereotyped? Could it, could it be that powerful? Well, there's a, 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 another clip that I, I'm sure many of you have seen that I think uh, uh, illustrates this, uh, again, in a, in, a, in a kind of interesting way. It comes from the blue-eyed, brown-eyed experiment. You may have seen this in, the, in, the, in years past. It's, it's, almost, it's over 40 years old, this, this uh, uh, videotape. It was uh, made by Jane Elliott, who was a school teacher in Riceville, Iowa. And the day after Martin Luther King uh, is, got assassinated, uh, she wanted some demonstration in her class that would give ki kids a sense of what his life was about, what the struggle uh, was about. And so she has some, a flash of an idea that what she's going to do is divide her class into blue-eyed kids and brown-eyed kids, and in alternate days, she's going to stigmatize them based on their eye color. And she stays up late into the night uh, making and ironing out collars that are the, to match the student's eye color so there can be no doubt as to what their eye color is. And she goes in the next day and she singles out the brown-eyed students and she has them put the collar on. And then she stands in front of the classroom and says that, you know, brown-eyed people are not good people. They're not intelligent people. They don't smell that. And she goes on and on like this. And uh, I think they should sit in the back of the classroom. And she has them stand up and move to the back of the classroom. And what you see is in the ABC uh, documentary, uh, you, you see the reenactment of this uh, 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 situation. Now, you know, you could never do an experiment like this today. <laughs> I mean, this is, <laughs> this is unconscionable to do. Uh, but back there, in those days, you could do some unconscionable but interesting experiments. <laughs> um, so you see how crushed these kids are by this, by this treatment. Uh, and the only, the only fair, fairness in the whole event is that the next day, she turns the tables and she treats the blue-eyed students with exactly the same thing. They, are, they have to wear a collar. She says they're not good people, not intelligent people. They don't smell so well. It's the same thing and the same kind of devastating reaction happens. Uh, to me, especially the poignant where kids, 
with the collars on, sort of huddled in the corners during recess. I mean, they didn't really, they couldn't sort of socially function in the situation. Well, uh, if you're interested in what happens to these kids, it's all on YouTube. You can, you can, there's so much documentation about what happens here, it's, and it's all kind of interesting. But the thing that interested me the most is something that didn't get paid a lot of attention to, is that at a certain point in the documentary, the kids are in the side of the room with her, and they're working through a problem deck. And she's keeping track of how fast the group of kids huddled around her at a table are working through the problem deck. Uh, and you can see there what effect having the collar on has on their cognitive scholastic performance in that situation. So I'll show you that little quick tape just to get a sense of it. So collars are, uh, 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 and the kind of explicit treatment that, that she uh, sets up there to implement the stigma, one could say that's pretty heavy handed. Uh, and still the question could be open, do you know, identities, just having an identity, walking into a classroom and, and having an identity that, that, that has a negative stereotype attached to it, could that alone be enough to affect cognitive performance in a situation like this. This could be coming from the heavy handedness of the demonstration uh, of the manipulation here, interesting uh, though it is. Uh, so you could ask that question. I think that for us is the, the next question. I just heard a talk a couple of weeks ago that uh, made me think maybe what uh, Jane Elliott did in the classroom isn't so heavy handed compared to reality. This was uh, uh, an anthropologist who had done a classroom uh, sort of ethnography of ethnicities in junior high school in North Oakland. And uh, she's looking at how kids use stereotypes. And the first thing, and this is a sort of classic uh, California classroom where you've got four groups in almost equal number, uh, whites, Asian, blacks, and Latinos. And uh, she's looking at how they relate to each other. And uh, one thing that's very dramatic is that they like stereotypes. They think they're cool. It's almost as if the stereotypes are giving these young kids who were seventh, eighth graders uh, their first sociological theory about how, how the world is organized and how it works. And they like it. They like using it. And they don't think of it as particularly bad. And, and so the stereotypes are, are just the stereotypes that we know. Uh, and we could all probably you know, write them down. What's the stereotype of? The, the, the white and Asian kids are smart, the black kids are not so smart, but they're really good athletes, and Latino kids are, nah, 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 but they're kind of gang-oriented, and those are the stereotypes. Uh, but they're using them in the, in the mix, just on a, as kind of everyday explanation of, of uh, ongoing be behavior. Uh, to, and so she, her strategy of studying it is that she sees, she tries to observe when, when somebody behaves in a way against the stereotype, how do the kids explain that. So uh, one day a black, uh, one of the black guys gets the highest grade in the math uh, test and, and everybody's just so impressed with him. They really are, are pulling for him and they say things like, man, that's fantastic. You, you must have some Asian in you, man. You know. <laughs> so, 
So uh, stereotypes are out there, <laughs> and they're, they're not so much coming from necessarily from, they, they, from teachers or the school. They're just coming from every which way, and they are offered to people as routes, as, as ways of interpreting their experience. Uh, so, but at, at any rate, the, the, you know, the, the question still is, do, do, could this, does this make a difference? So the first experiment we ever did, I think, had that kind of motive uh, behind it. Suppose we just do the least possible. Uh, could you get an effect like this? So what we did in that very first experiment, now when I say first, this is the first uh, experiment we did that took the form of a, of a typical stereotype threat study. We had done oceans of other experiments looking at other ideas and so on, but this is the first one that looked like, that tested something like stereotype threat. We got Women, women and men math students at Michigan, sophomores, juniors, who were really, 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 really good at math, uh, as indicated by their SAT scores, by their prior grades, by their stated motivations about how important math was to them personally and to their career uh, aspirations and all that. So they were, they were, these were the top of the, of the, of the, the hill with regard to uh, math skills and motivation. We brought them into the laboratory one at a time and gave them a very difficult math test, a half hour section of the graduate record uh, exam you take if you're a math major, not the general quantitative section, but the math major section of the exam. And our idea was that if all this reasoning is true, is correct, uh, is the better scientific way to put that, uh, then this would be a very different experience for a woman than it would be for a man. For a man, this experience, this experience would be frustrating. We'd set it up to be frustrating. Uh, and they could find out or worry that they're not as good at math as they thought they were. And that could be upsetting and distracting and so on. Uh, but for a woman, there would be this extra pressure in there. That in addition to thinking that from the frustration, she might also think that, geez, uh, am I sort of meeting this limitation, that inability, that the stereotype alleges? Is this, am I meeting my sort of gender-based Waterloo with regard to this? Is, is Larry Summers right? Uh, <laughs> no, that's not true. She, they, he, he's an idiot. I hate him. Uh, I, and just, so a lot of sort of rumination and cognition starts to happen to resist the stereotype. So this would be a very different situation for women than it would be for men because it's hard, it's frustrating, that makes the stereotype about the group relevant as an interpretation of personal experience. That's a critical uh, thing here. And, as soon as it, and, and that's, gonna, that's the fact that's gonna make this a different situation for women than it is for, for men. That was the idea. We did the experiment and sure enough, women performed like a full standard deviation worse than men. So we had completely bottled in the laboratory, recapitulated in the laboratory what we found in the advanced math courses at, at Michigan. This mysterious underperformance of women in this cir circumstance. Now, somebody could come out, somebody, and there were plenty of them, <laughs> and say, well, you just supported Larry Summers. Because um, Larry Summers said something, the, the reason I use his name is because his quote was just so perfect for this. His quote was, the reason we don't have uh, enough women in our science faculty is that among a lot of things, career issues and preferences and so on, among a lot of things, it could be that, that women just lack ability at the high end. Uh, well, th we gave them a test at the high end and women didn't do as well as men, so who did we support? All the stereotype threat stuff? or Larry Summers. And I can just tell you, there was a lot of tension in our laboratory in this era. <laughs> uh, we knew the experiment, that we had to do an experiment to separate these two. It just was really hard to come up with a clear way of separating the two. It took us a year. And finally, we came up with a simple manipulation that would make this, that would take the stereotype threat out of the situation, and then we could see what happened. The manipulation was this. We just told them, redid the experiment, this time telling them just before they take the exam, uh, look, you may have heard that women are not as good at math, uh, uh, especially uh, difficult standardized math tests, that they don't do as well on difficult standardized math tests as, 
uh, as men. You might have heard that. But that's not true for this test, not for the test you're taking today. This is a test on which women always do as well as men. It's just no, it's just you. Cause no. So the subtext here is any frustration you experience on this particular test cannot be taken as a confirmation of some gender-based limitation in math. Can't, it could be that you aren't as good at math as you thought, but that would be because of something about you as an individual, not because of you as a woman. So with that little sentence, we change the situation in one precise way, which is to just make the stereotype in our society about women's math ability irrelevant for, women to, for these women to, in, to use in interpreting their experience on this test. So with that simple experiment, a sentence, it sounds like, how could that make a difference? But it's, it's, it's making the stereotype out there in our society about women's math ability irrelevant as an interpretation of their performance on this particular test. And as soon as we did that to our great glee, women performed the same as equally skilled men in that situation. The difference went completely away. Uh, you know, it was a revelation to us. A gr we were grateful for it. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that uh, <laughs> finding. <laughs> Uh, it, it was remarkable. We, would, we, would, we replicated it and replicated it. We would take it to conferences and people wouldn't believe it. Uh, but the difference went completely away. Race studies. Um, same thing. I'll give you some other. We, Josh Aronson and I did a number of them, but then some other people did, did, did use the procedure. I just think it's a lot cleaner and has more generalizability to real life. They, they gave black and white college students an IQ test and it was a nonverbal IQ test. It's the gold standard of IQ tests, the Raven's Progressive Matrices. Each item is a big square, and there's a pattern on the square. And then there's five little squares, and you have to pick which of those little squares has the same pattern as the pattern in the big square. That's it. So you're just matching patterns. And it starts out pretty easy, and you just start cooking along. You think, boy, I'm really smart. Uh, and then it starts to get really frustrating, and then it starts to get almost impossible. So frustration comes in. And you'll note I'm emphasizing frustration, because it's frustration that makes the stereotype about your group relevant as an interpretation of your own experience. Without the frustration, in the easy math courses in college, uh, with less frustration, if you're performing well within your own skills, you, there's no need to, for that stereotype to come online as an interpretation of, what you're, of what, what's happening to you because you're not having any frustration. You're just doing fine. So that stereotype that says your group isn't that good at this, it's just irrelevant to the situation. So it's the frustration that is the critical thing here. And sure enough, uh, when, blacks, when nothing was said about this and they were just allowed to assume it was a test of cognitive abilities or when, we explicitly, when they explicitly told them it was an IQ test, in either case, Black students performed a full standard deviation worse than white students, which is the exact size of the IQ difference between blacks and whites in the general population. The exact size. So, how do you get stereotype threat out of this situation? Well, this, this is why I like this experiment. It has the nicety that these items look like you're playing a puzzle. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be read as, a, as an IQ test, as a test of cognitive abilities. So, in the other condition, the experiment has told the subjects, look, we're just working with a puzzle today. This test, this puzzle, it's just a puzzle. It doesn't have anything to do with your, with your abilities or how smart you are or anything like this. It's just a puzzle. We just want you to have fun with it, do the best you can with it, just play with it, have fun with it. Boom. That, that's, they, they go off doing that. Well, under that instruction, black students perform exactly the same as white students on that test. Exactly the same. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, is that, they, these are the, you know, you, for, after so many years of trying to figure something out and then you start getting this really strong pattern of data, your conviction deepens that, uh, oh, I think there is something here. And I, and I also think that this stereotype threat is a big enough and powerful enough a force that it can affect things like 
like really important cognitive performances. I might have in my other frame of mind said, look, when you got a test as important as an IQ test or a test in school, that people are just going to power through that, man. It isn't, that this kind of ephemeral thing of this relevance of the stereotype, and all, that is just not going to be enough to repress people because uh, they're just going to, it's so important to them, they're just going to motivate themselves through it. But as it turned out, that's, that explanation is both right and wrong. The, 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 the underperformance is caused by people pushing themselves through it, trying to beat the stereotype. I, I have a, a, a chapter in the book that's sort of my favorite chapter. It's called The Efforting Life. Being under stereotype threat in a domain where you really want to achieve in it, and you're invested in it, uh, uh, you're always trying to beat that stereotype on top of doing the thing that's in the, the domain. And that's, what's, that's the problem here in these examples I give you. I think the simplest metaphor to use in trying to understand the experience of stereotype threat and how it interferes with performance is multitasking. You're doing two things at once. You're trying to take the test and figure that out, and at the same time, another part of your brain is trying to resist the stereotype and disprove the stereotype and counter-argue the stereotype and say it's not true and, is, and prove that it's not true. But then there's another frustration and that raises it again. And, uh, so you've got a lot of stuff going on at the same time that that clock is ticking and uh, you uh, just don't have the same attentional resources to pay to the manifest task at hand of doing the, the, the test. That's how I think uh, it, it works. Uh, we, we know an awful lot uh, uh, now about how this phenomenon is mediated. It's mediated pretty much as, a, as I've said. There's a kind of allocation, there's sort of a division of attention between the task and the business of refuting and disproving the stereotype. That's what the person is trying very hard to do, is refute this, uh, the, the, this stereotype. Uh, it's reflected, this, this, this Pressured multitasking is reflected in all kinds of physiological symptomatology, accelerated heart rate, blood pressure, uh, suppression of the frontal, the prefrontal cortex, uh, uh, excitement of the amygdala, which is a part of the brain much more vigilant to threat. So you get a very vivid pattern of physiological uh, reaction in, in, among people who are experiencing stereotype threat. But interestingly, interestingly, they don't self-report that. They don't say it. They don't seem to realize it. I remember the first studies we, we did, we would see that this kid had just screwed up the test and, and that they were really trying hard. And we'd go in and we'd talk to them. And, and they'd say, no, no, I, I, I know how to deal with these situations. I, 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 just, I just redouble my efforts and I just put my energies in there. I, they didn't have a subjective sense of it, even though you could tell from the physiological arousal that they were very aroused in this situation. So there's that kind of uh, feature to the threat. We don't enjoy uh, a great deal of access, I guess, or, or ability to cognitively recognize that we're under this threat when we are, in fact, uh, under it. It's undermining our performance. It's causing uh, big physiological reactions. But subjectively, we don't have a sense that it's there. Well, another feature of it that is important and that I took another long time to bring into view, but I try to focus the book more on this part of it, is that stereotype threat is a contingency of identity. It's something that goes with your identity in specific situations. And you can't just simply disprove it once and get rid of it. It's a feature, uh, uh, it's tied to your identity in certain situations. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about every, uh, I, you know, we'll talk in, I'll talk in a minute about uh, uh, thinking about how history visits our present lives through the forms of stereotype threat it imposes on uh, all of us. But one critical aspect of that is to recognize that it's tied to uh, our identity. It goes with our identity. I'll play you a little tape here. This is an interview of Bill, that Bill Maher is doing of Charles Blow. Charles Blow is an African-American editorialist for the New York Times, does that graphic editorial on Saturdays. And he's talking about uh, his reaction to the Trayvon Martin uh, circumstance. And you get some sense of how it, this kind of threat is a chronic feature of life.
you have to watch. I mean, it's almost exhausting. As a you can't kid. wear a hoodie. Well, you not only can you not wear a hoodie, but you, you, you literally are consciously paying attention to the way you move your body. Right. It is, an, it is a physically exhausting exercise to know I can't run or make a sudden movement because now I see some cop standing in the corner and he's looking this way. Or I can't put my hands in my waistband as George Zimmerman says that Trayvon Martin had his hands in his waistband because that may signal that I have some sort of weapon. The, the kind of constant having to think about how you are positioning your body so that no one takes advantage of that and, and views this suspicious and maybe takes your life or takes you to jail is exhausting. Well, um, keep that in mind, and then think about this experiment. Uh, we bring into the laboratory uh, white guys, <laughs> one at a time. And we, we let them understand that they're going to be in a conversation with two other students, and the experiment is about a conversation. Uh, and then they see the two pictures of, they see the two pictures of the two people they're going to be in conversation with, and in one condition, one uh, group, uh, the, the two pictures are of two black guys. And in the other group, the two pictures are of two white guys. And then they find out that they're going to either talk about uh, love and relationships, which uh, people can talk pretty easily about with any, almost anybody, apparently, uh, or they're going to talk about racial profiling. So... Um, then the experimenter says uh, they're going to either talk, you're going to talk to two white guys, two black guys, either about racial profiling or uh, about love and relationships. The experimenter then says, look, I'm going to go down the hall and I'm going to get uh, your two conversation partners and bring them back. And by the way, would you, would you just hang around for a minute and arrange the three chairs in the room for that conversation? Would you just do that while I'm gone? Uh, and as, as you might imagine, when they do that, the experiment's over. You're, you're interested to see how do they arrange the chairs as a, a function of what conversation they expect to have. And you can probably predict the results. That when they're going to talk to two white guys about anything, uh, the, th the, the, the three chairs are very close together. And when they're going to talk to the two black guys about love and relationships, the three chairs are very close together. But when they're going to talk to two black guys about racial profiling, these are two stranger black guys about racial profiling. <laughs> They put the two black guys over here and they put themselves over here. <laughs> they put a distance kind of between themselves here. Uh, and and the, the interesting thing about it, we, have, uh, we measure what's on the top of their, their, their brains, so to speak, uh, by a, a kind of a, a series of instruments that are a lot like Rorschach tests. And what's on the top of their brains when they're in that condition going to talk to uh, two black guys uh, uh, about racial profiling is I don't want to be seen as a racist. I don't want, uh, I don't want, to, I don't want to be seen as a racist. I don't know these guys. Uh, uh, I, I don't want, that's the stereotype threat that the white participants experience in this interracial interaction is uh, 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 the threat of being seen in terms of the overarching stereotypes about whites that maybe, maybe, maybe they could see me as racist or racially insensitive or in knowing, unknowing in some important ways, and that would be just terrible. In and also interesting, we also had their levels of prejudice measured in several ways. And this is not a highly this, is, this distribution doesn't have a, this is, these are Stanford students, they don't have a lot of highly prejudiced people, but they do have a range of prejudice there. And you, the, the interesting thing is, who do you think in that critical condition where a white guy is going to talk to two black guys about uh, racial profiling, who put their chair, who kept their chairs farthest away? Was it the least prejudiced or the most prejudiced? It's the least, least prejudiced. Who shows the biggest uh, math impairment under stereotype threat? The women who, the, who are the strongest and most committed to math or the women who are less committed to math? It's the ones who are the strongest and the most committed to math that, that show the biggest effect. Which African American show same? In all of these stereotype threat paradigms, the members of the group that show the biggest impact of possibly being stereotyped in a way that you don't want to be based on one of your identities 
uh, are the people who care the most about performing well in the domain where the stereotype applies. That's the tragedy of, say, Eminem, is that he was foolhardy enough to fully identify with a domain of performance in which his particular group is negatively stereotyped. That's what makes him vulnerable to the pressure of stereotype threat. It's, it's not that, that he has low self-esteem or that he doesn't have the skills. or that, uh, I, we, As a psychologist, I can tell you, we looked at all those possibilities first. I thought just, those were just things you take off the shelf and look at. But none of those things work. Every time we looked, it was the group, members of the group who, had the, who were the strongest in these ways that were showing the, the effects. And I think this, this uh, uh, experiment I just described about white stereotype threat really illustrates the same principle, that it's the group that cares the most about not being seen as racist that is distancing themselves the most under the possibility to, to, to deflect the threat the most. Stay away from that. Well, uh, so you got, you got Charles Blow and you got this experiment. If that is not American history visiting us in, in contemporary life, I don't know what is. These, th this, is th we, this is our history and this is how. This, these kinds of mechanisms, these stereotypes, bring that history from the past right into our relationships with each other. And they do it through this particular mechanism. Uh, and we're, uh, we're, awfully, we're oftentimes not looking at this mechanism. We're thinking, we're using a completely different paradigm uh, for understanding it. And that paradigm is that the big problem between groups in the United States is prejudice. Prejudice, direct disliking. Well, you can see in that experiment I just described, it wasn't prejudice that put the distance between uh, the, the participant and the two conversation partners. It wasn't prejudice. It was the fear, the worry about being seen in terms of that historical uh, stereotype that did that. Uh, now, down, and I, I would argue, I was just saying this uh, in, in a session earlier today, just for the sake of being clear and just to push the point really far, farther than I actually believe, but just for the sake of clarity, I'll say, uh, this phenomenon is more important in our daily lives than this prejudice phenomenon. This, uh, this apprehension about what, uh, doing something that's going to cause us to be seen in a particular way, uh, you know, in terms of some stereotype about our identity, that this is the more powerful struggle in American life today than it is... This, now, that's really a, a strong statement. I recognize that. <laughs> but that, that this, this particular pressure is stronger than this worry about prejudice and direct behaving on the basis of prejudice. What makes this pressure strong? What makes it weak? If we can answer that question, we can begin to get to remedies. Quick story. Sandra Day O'Connor, interviewed by Nina Totenberg on the radio about her her autobiography. Totenberg says, well, what was it like to be the first woman on the Supreme Court? Uh, O'Connor says, it was asphyxiating. It was just asphyxiating. Everywhere I went, the press followed me. They talked about my intelligence. They talked about my wisdom. Was I feminist? Was I not feminist enough? They followed me in restaurants, up the steps of my house. It was asphyxiating. It was horrible. Every time a decision happened, it was reviewed ruthlessly in the papers. And, I just felt suffocated. Well, Totenberg says, what, what happened when Ruth Bader Ginsburg got there? She says, well, when everything changed. Everything changed. Uh, I just stopped getting all that kind of attention. There were two women on the Supreme Court now. It just didn't, it just didn't make sense for the press to ask all those same kind of questions about two women, just, especially women who are sort of ideologically different. It didn't seem to make sense. And so pretty soon that, start, that attention went away and we were just like two normal women on the Supreme Court. Uh, so I, as I say in the book, I heard about this about a month before the, the uh, decision on affirmative action in 2003 was going to be announced and I thought I knew how that decision was going to go because Sandra Day O'Connor was the deciding justice in that. The, all the other justices were equally divided. She was the, she was the swing vote. Uh, and I thought as soon as I heard that interview that I knew how it was going to go because Michigan's defense of affirmative action, the University of Michigan's defense, was that uh, it was important to have critical mass, that you couldn't expect 
uh, uh, minorities and women in certain areas, you couldn't expect them to be just a tiny minority because that would be so much kind of identity pressure that it would distract from their functioning in school and, 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 the, and that's why you need, we needed the policy of affirmative action. Now to a lot of people, as we all know, that, that, I, that rationale doesn't have a lot of traction, but I knew it would have some traction for Sandra Day O'Connor because she had been on the Supreme Court without critical mass, and she'd been on the Supreme Court with critical mass. As soon as Ruth Bader ben Ginsburg comes on the Supreme Court, she has critical mass. Her identity as a woman is no longer the sole focus of attention. It's such a big, reified thing in the, in, in the environment and in, in her life. So she, she could understand this. She had an experience in life which would enable her to understand that. Well, uh, that's the kind of thing that makes these pressures, the stereotype threat, stronger or weaker are the, the cues in the situation. Think of that as a cue in a situation that signals to you how significant this identity is going to be in the situation. If you're the only identity in the situation, the only old guy in some situations uh, I've been in recently, <laughs> uh, uh, you, 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 you kind of start to count. And you say, well, what, why am I counting? You're trying to figure out whether this identity makes a difference or, or not. So the, 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 the circumstances around which the cues in the situation uh, give, are, are the, the, the source of, of this threat. That's, where, that's what we sort of shifted to uh, in trying to understand the kind of factors that made, make this thing weak or not. Uh, think about how diversity is presented. If you present diversity as something that is in, essentially in competition with excellence, um, how are you going to feel in a, if you're a minority in a situation where you're going to feel like I'm, my identity, who I am, is not really bringing anything to the table? I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, it's, in fact, I could be detracting from it, or at least I could be seen as detracting from it, because people think excellence is something over here and diversity is something over there. And in fact, uh, maybe there's a zero-sum game. The maybe more we do for diversity, the more, uh, the less we're going to really take. We're going to take away from excellence, and and we're going to have that kind of competition. Well, if that becomes the kind of cultural framework that people use to think about the issues and talk about the issues, then you could see that that's going to make that's that's going to increase the sense of identity threat in a situation. The, the, the intentions may be quite the contrary, but the fact of it is going to be to increase the, the sense of threat. So that's another feature of a situation, cue in a situation, like critical mass, that can have an effect of amplifying uh, a, a threat. A much better approach is to say that diversity is essential to excellence, that you really cannot have, even in the most um, rarefied of disciplines, uh, you really cannot have excellence if you have just too much homogeneity, that you need diversity of perspectives to have an excellent enterprise. I believe that. that uh, that's where we, as a society, uh, have always had a kind of um, secret weapon, is that we're such a diverse society, and we've had so many perspectives to come to bear on so many of the problems, from the mundane and concrete to the political and and uh, philosophical that a society faces. We've had so many perspectives to draw from that we benefit from that diversity, but we haven't acknowledged it uh, as, as such. Uh, that framework about diversity, that it really is that, you know, this is the Scott Page argument, that uh, adding new perspectives to an area is as important to the excellence of an area as adding increments in skill. I've seen this in psychology. When, we were, when I came into social psychology, it was a, a, a male, down, it was hardly any women at all, and we were, we were going to mathematicize all of psychology. We all remembered our high school algebra, and we were going to describe all these processes in terms of mathematical models. And if you, couldn't, if you had a process that couldn't be captured in, a, in an algebraic model, you just thought it wasn't scientific. You just ruled it out of order. Uh, and our field was really very narrow <laughs> for that reason. And women began to come into the field, and they had a kind of impatience with this. Uh, and it just didn't, you know, they, they felt that the field could offer a lot, but that it was just too narrow, and they brought in other topics, and, and uh, uh, other things started to happen. 
and uh, they, the, the, the field, the topic-wise, method, methodology-wise, and a whole variety of ways, the field got broader and broader and broader. And that, so with that conception of diversity, I can go on in this way. I want to sort of bring this to a close here. Uh, uh, it, but presented that way, the, uh, one, one realizes one's identity contributes to a situation as opposed to uh, being a, 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 a detriment to a situation, and that, again, reduces the threats. Well, um, I could go on in this vein. The important thing to, to stress is that I don't think stereotype threat reflects an internalized vulnerability. For a while, I did think that but the data just didn't support it in just the ways I've just described. I think it does come from the features of a situation, the degree to which they raise the possibility that my identity could be, uh, based on my identity, I could be seen stereotypically in a situation. How significant is this identity in, in a situation and what kind of image does it have in a situation? The cues tell me this in a situation. Uh, and so when we think about remedying a situation, I think, and you think institutionally, I think you want to think about cues and how things, how an institution presents itself and use as many degrees of freedom, uh, as many opportunities as you can think of in a situation to change those cues around so that they don't send that kind of a signal to people. I just talked about uh, how diversity is represented. That's a, a, a big deal. Uh, that's uh, something that institutions have some control over, and the whole rationale for diversity, I think, can be very different than the, more, than the most typical one that, in, that institutions we use. That's an example. Uh, I do think uh, role models, existence proofs, are, are critical. Uh, being in a country as an African American where uh, Obama is, is a president, where, an, where somebody of your identity can be, the president is very different than being in the country where somebody of your identity cannot be the president. It just makes a huge difference. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, turn over the whole racial organization, the historically uh, produced racial organization of society. It doesn't do that, but it does represent something significant. I think that's another uh, kind of thing that uh, people can do. Um, I'm a little worried about going over my time here. Uh, how much time do I have? Am I over my time? I have zero. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me just say, uh, if you ask me questions about how, uh, you know, how individuals can cope with the stereotype threat, I might be able to give an answer. <laughs> but I, I will stop at this point. So you guys can, thank you. Questions, and I, I will repeat the question uh, in, in case uh, the audience can't hear. Uh, Kate? So the question was experience of the teachers and how can they, uh, uh, how can they mitigate the stereotype threat? Uh. Uh, well, one thing I can say is that my wife has just finished a book on that. It's called Identity Safety, and it is a kind of compendium of strategies. She's focusing especially on K through 12 uh, uh, teachers. Uh, and uh, so this will be coming out in September, I think. Dorothy Steele. Uh, and uh, uh, in there, you know, there are a variety of things. I was, we were talking about this earlier today, and, and uh, there, there are a variety of particular strategies. I'll try to give a big uh, summary construct, which is that trust. And I think a lot of teachers do this really well uh, anyway. You know, one of the remarkable things in that videotape about Jane Elliott is how much the students trusted her, even though they'd just gone through this kind of experience, the kind of, they really like that woman. <laughs> uh, and, and, and st you know, students have that capacity to really like and love their, their teachers, and so I, and I think uh, teachers, uh, many teachers are very good at understanding uh, that that is a critical part of teaching, is building a trust between they and their, their students. And to recognize that these identity differences, especially as kids get older, I think, 
uh, that these identity differences uh, have to be dealt with, that they are kind of going to, they have the potential of interfering with trust. And, and that, uh, you know, ways of assuring people that you understand their circumstances, that you empathize with their circumstances, and that you think a, a good deal of them and expect a good deal of them. It's, it's sort of a combination of, uh, of high demands, this is serious, this work is valuable, I think that has to be projected, but I think you can achieve this. That, that combination tells the student that you're not diminishing them because of the stereotype. You're expecting a lot out of them, and you think that they can meet those, those standards. That's been uh, uh, something that in, in our research is a very un amazingly powerful uh, strategy in, in, in these circumstances. I, I don't think that it requires a huge amount of, uh, this will, can sound maybe, um, um, I don't know what, bad <laughs> uh, to say this, but I don't think it requires a lot of sophistication about race and, and, and so on. I, I remember my own uh, advisor, I used the example of this in the, in the book, who was very effective in my case. I think I was ex ex suffering an extreme case of uh, stereotype threat. Uh, and, uh, but he just related to me very directly, but he related to me in, in that I knew he believed in me. I knew he, he took me seriously. He demanded a lot. He cared about what I thought. He'd walk, he'd, he'd walk down the hall, he'd stick his head in the office and say, well, what do you think about this? And, and that just told me everything. You know, he, he thinks that what I think about this could be, you know, it's true for any student, but, but given the, the kind of extra uh, stresses I felt in that situation, it was a particularly powerful uh, thing to do. And so I, I think teachers have a good, a powerful repertoire already in hand that can be very effective in these situations. And, and there are probably many teachers that know that, that, that have had some, some success there uh, using these kinds of strategies. Any other questions? Yes, the second row there. The question was about uh, the intersection of race and gender stereotypes. Yeah, uh, there, there has been interest in this in the research literature. Like, is there a double whammy there? Uh, so that you go this far down with one and then that far, far it, the, it's, it's hard to answer that in a definitive way. Uh, it doesn't seem to be quite a double whammy, uh, but it does seem to, there seems to be a slightly a, a, an additive effect. Um, so, yes, when you intersect identities like that, uh, they, they're, they're, there does seem to be that kind of an impact. But, but the good news is, or at least good news in certain circumstances, is that oftentimes uh, making oneself aware of the positive side of the identity can, be, can reduce that uh, effect. Uh, for example, uh, one, we just stumbled on this uh, finding years ago looking, replicating those experiments on women in math. And uh, when we would remind women that they were Stanford students, the effect got a lot smaller. Uh, and then when we reminded women of other women that were really successful, and, uh, the effect got a lot smaller. Uh, so a lot of it depends on kind of, you know, reminding oneself of the positive side of, 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 uh, of the of the identity. That can be very effective in reducing that. Uh, back there. So the question was uh, um, whether the same stereotype threats are applicable in the high school level and not only in the college level. Yes, <laughs> I do. Um, the, the, the evidence seems to support that. The younger you go, I think the evidence gets more ambiguous. It takes a, a more powerful circumstance to bring this online for younger kids, although I do think it's it, it happens in very, very young kids sometimes because even you, you get these doll study findings 
And that happens in kids who are as, as young as four years of, uh, of age, who, who somehow know, I, I have two three-year-old, three almost four-year-old grandsons, uh, and they, all, they already have a sense that how, you know, they're, they just pick up these little jokes about chocolate and so on. So they, they have a sense very early that, that their group is seen a certain way, uh, and what's cool and what's not cool. And so the doll study findings, I think, uh, do tell us. I don't think they tell us what we originally thought they told us, that there's some early internalization of these negative stereotypes. I just think it's a picking up of the social environment. And so I think uh, that's where stereotype threat lives, is in that social environment, and it can happen very early. Um, back there, and then I'll go to this, and I'll take three more questions. We have a reception afterwards. You can engage with Dr. Steele uh, uh, over order. Um, so back there. So the question was about the effect of um, the health effect of the, the physical pressures of stereotype uh, threat on individuals who are experiencing. So the, the heightened level of uh, blood pressure, the stress, and how it affects uh, the general health, right? Yeah, uh, I'd say there's only conjecture at this point. Uh, I, I don't know of, of a direct, you know, there's the, the literature that shows the effects of stereotype threat on physiological reactivity, and, and it also shows the fact that people don't enjoy much access to that. So it has the same kind of uh, uh, sort of subliminal features that hypertension has. Uh, but I haven't seen a connection, a, a real empirical connection between the two. I can conjecture that one might be there. I do in the book uh, review the evidence uh, of, of race and social class on on uh, hypertension. And so I, I raised that possibility, but I, I don't know if it's been formally tested yet. So, but, you know, it's a good guess. Uh, right there. Um, so a couple of years ago at an academic conference, another social psychologist, John Haidt, uh, sort of famously argued that some of these same processes happen for political conservatives in, in our field and uh, in <laughs> academic institutions of higher learning more generally. And sort of said that we need systemic, systemic solutions to this problem. And as sort of a liberal problem child that he's talking about, I struggled with this because I understand that a diversity of perspectives is important. But what about when that perspective is that a diversity of perspectives isn't important? Um, so I'm wondering sort of what your take on that is. Do you want to try to repeat that? <laughs> Do I need to repeat the question? OK. So um, the gentleman here I, uh, I, <laughs> quoted John Haidt, who said that the uh, stereotype threat, the experience of stereotype threat also occurs in academia for conservatives. And as a, I think you identified yourself as a liberal, <laughs> uh, he's trying to think, how, how can you uh, systemically approach that, and um, especially when diversity is can you help me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that part, I, I, I lost it a little bit. I, I got the general thrust of the question. Uh, first, I, I agree probably in, in most social sciences, if you're conservative among social scientists, you're going to feel a lot of stereotype threat uh, because <laughs> uh, most social scientists are not conservative. And uh, so if you express that kind of a view, you would be very... Uh, right to assume that you could be judged in terms of a negative stereotype about, about conservatives. So, uh, and I'm surprised John Hyde gave us that much credit, or at least characterized the problem that way, because I do think that's a good way to, to characterize the, the, the problem, is, is that it is a, a form of stereotype threat that, that when, you want a, when you want a social science to have a full reach of, of perspectives, it, 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 it's going to, this form of stereotype threat is going to make that harder to, to happen. Uh, but then I missed. Well, sort of, I, like, do you think the same sort of solutions would apply to fixing this oh, problem? Yeah. Do you think the same mm -hmm. kind of solutions will apply to fixing I, I would. I would hope so. I, I would hope so. I, I would, um, in that instance, 
um, uh, turned for, you know, one of the things that is, a, is a, a kind of a chicken soup for stereotype threat as an individual strategy for reducing stereotype threat is to think of whatever it is that is alleged in the stereotype. Uh, uh, as, as an expandable thing. This is sort of a Carol Dweck uh, import of that idea into this uh, literature as a remedy for stereotype threat. But to, to think of, uh, if you think of intelligence, for example, or math ability, let's say, as, as expandable, you know, it's not something that is limited by uh, a kind of genetic uh, capacity that you're sort of given. Uh, that's an American ideology. I'll use that word. That's an American ideology. It's not all over the world. Uh, but in America, we tend to, and in other, some other Western societies, we tend to think of ability that way. But if you think of ability as something, uh, a lot of Asian societies think of math ability as hard work, man. It's like not, they're not focused so much on the, a limiting capacity. Like, how much did you work? And how organized are you? And how, uh, so that's a very different underlying assumption to have. And if you have that underlying assumption, being in a group whose, abil whose ability isn't seen as good, it just doesn't have the same meaning. It doesn't have the same consequence. I could get good. Maybe I haven't decided to get good, or I'm not, but I could get good. So it, it, it reduces the impact a little. So I don't know where I'm going with regard to conservatives here, but uh, <laughs> maybe, they could, <laughs> maybe they could think of, of themselves as open to influence. And I, I don't know what. I don't know what the heck I'll, they can uh, do. I'll take the <laughs> I last feel for question them. Uh, there uh, in, in the far right. And then, yes, and then uh, we'll conclude. Yes. So, uh, at around age 12, a lot of girls uh, show interest in things that don't relate to computing, and a lot of boys just want to get to So the question was about computer science here at Cornell, uh, retention of uh, women students in computer science is a challenge and whether there's a way to test for that earlier on. Yes. Yeah, there, there is a good deal of stereotype threat research on women in computer science in particular. Sapna Sharian uh, is a social psychologist at, at the University of Washington in Seattle and she has these geek studies, you know, where she gives them uh, coding task to do, uh, and the room is full of sort of geek signs, uh, or it's not full of geek signs, and she shows performance differences and and, and motivation to go f go on with this in this with this work as a career differences as a function of that. So the experimental evidence is uh, you know kind of su very suggestive of of something like this. Um, you know, one fact I always remember about that is that the verbal score on the SAT is the best predictor of computer science, better predictor than the math score. And women have better verbal scores than, than do uh, men. Uh, and I, but I do think even in the 12-year-olds, I wish this weren't the case, but I think even among 12-year-olds, they begin to sense that, uh, that this is a more of a, a boy's domain. This, and, and, and there have been differences that have sort of in play habits and things that people, there's a lot of socialization that's going on to to uh, uh, kind of uh, what's would genderize these domains. Uh, I don't know if at 12, year old, at 12 years old, whether it's stereotype threat that's driving that or maybe just straight ahead gender preferences. That, that could be a, a, a compelling factor there. Uh, but when you get to college, and if they've been interested that long and you start to see a turning away from it, um, stereotype threat starts to be a candidate. Is stereotype threat is a candidate for white males in computer science at Stanford? Because most of the students, I mean, I have interviewed this and looked into this pretty closely. Most of the students are, are Asian, South, South, Southeast Asian. And so uh, I, here, here's, I can remember this sort of amazingly poignant story of, of interviewing white males who left, dropped out of the course. And I had their academic records. I knew that they were really good. And uh, one, typical one typical thing they would say is that, I, well, I went to the course, and, and um, yeah, I'm in a big university now. I was good in this in high school and so forth. But I just don't know if I want to work that hard. 
So that's how they experience the, the, the fact of being uh, an identity minority in this situation, given the reputational differences. You know, we've done stereotype threat experiments where uh, you give, uh, this is maybe more of a West Coast uh, kind of uh, thing than, than it is here. I just, I just don't know, but uh, it, we've done things at Stanford where we've given uh, graduate students in engineering a really difficult math test. Uh, and to create stereotype threat for uh, white uh, uh, engineering students, we would say just before the test, um, look, uh, this, is, this is a good test. Uh, we want you to do the best you can on this. This is a test on which Asians tend to do better than whites. Here, do the best you can. <laughs> so there, there is out there this stereotype that this is an Asian domain. It's increasingly seen that way in the high schools in San Francisco and, and and, and uh, a little bit in Stanford and Berkeley. Uh, and, this, and so then you get another group that you'd never think of uh, kind of withdrawing interest in that. So I think this, these kind of processes do, you know, sorting out all the causes, it's not the only cause, but it could be, a, in some situations, a, a significant one. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Steele for a fascinating talk. Thank you.